Well, the only downside I can see to uh, wearing the masks when we're singing is if you're a bad singer, you're hearing yourself, okay? <laughs> so there's that. Uh, but you know, I, I, <laughs> see, that's better, just instead of just Tim, you know, that's, that's much better, I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, during this time when we've been taping the services on Saturday, uh, Sherry and I have visited our uh, former church, Hope, they've been meeting together for a couple of months to just see how it works, and it's very similar to our setup here. And I noticed that wearing a mask, you could still sing, and you could still hear others, not kind of somewhat muffled, but it's really, really wonderful. And we just knew that once we gathered together again, it would be beautiful to be in the house of the Lord. So uh, welcome to each and every one of you. It's good to have you here with us. And welcome to all those who are online as well. We're so happy that you're tuning in and you're part of our family as well. So how many of you love going on journeys, adventures, road trips? Okay, oh, some of your hands went down immediately. But uh, <laughs> we love all the, Sherry and I love all of those things. In fact, we were looking forward to our 50th wedding anniversary trip. It was a 26-day uh, tour, or, uh, cruise from Fort Lauderdale, transatlantic, eight ports in different places in Europe, finishing with six days in the Norwegian fjords. Man, that was going to be a journey that was like nothing else, right? But alas, we did not go on that cruise. And uh, things have changed dramatically in our world in the last seven months. Well, today we begin a different type of journey, an incredible journey that will not be stalled by COVID. It will not be derailed by whether the next president of the United States is Donald Trump or Joe Biden. This journey will not end because of any kingdom of man circumstances. It's a journey into life. Really, uh, it's an invitation into a life that will never, I want to repeat that, never end. And so for the next six weeks, we are going to be looking at uh, the small epistle in the New Testament of 1 John. Now, a little context. Uh, John was the disciple. He, he claimed himself in the Gospel of John. Uh, he claimed that he was the disciple. And we, anybody want to take a guess at what that is? Whom what? Whom Jesus loved. Okay? That's like me going around telling me, I'm the man who Sherry loves, you know. In other words, he was really proud of the fact that Jesus loved him. And the other disciples, maybe not so much, but Jesus really loved me. In fact, if you look at some of the Renaissance paintings, Michelangelo and some of the others, it's John that's kind of always leaning into Jesus. John was probably the youngest disciple, maybe 16 or 17 years old. Uh, he was also the one that lived the longest. All of the other uh, disciples were martyred. Uh, John lived until probably into his 90s on the island of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. He saw the vision from Jesus and he wrote the book of Revelation. So in between that, the gospel he wrote probably around 50 to 55 AD. Well, these epistles he probably wrote around 70 to 75. Actually, it was before uh, the temple was destroyed because otherwise he would have mentioned it. So somewhere in the early 70s, uh, he probably wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, in 1st John, he is speaking to uh, Christ followers, and he's saying, listen, uh, there's some danger out there, and the danger is with false prophets. And specifically, the danger is with Gnostics or Gnosticism. Uh, it comes from the Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-I-S-I-S, -I -S, which means knowledge. And Gnosticism proclaimed the idea that what really mattered was what you know about God. Now they said the, the flesh is evil, so the flesh doesn't matter, and uh, that's why, you know, if you do stuff with your flesh that, you know, you know, eat too much, have sex with too many people, all those, it doesn't really matter because the flesh is just bad. But the mind is what really matters. John comes in and speaks a new truth to this. And that new truth is this. The mind is good. The body is good. But where it really matters is the heart. What really matters is that part of you on the inside that connects to God and connects to other people. 
And so we're going to go on a journey for the next six weeks in the book of 1 John. Now today we're going to do kind of an uh, introduction and an overview of what we'll be studying. And then there's five chapters in 1 John. And we'll be looking at a selected passage in each one of those chapters for the, uh, starting next week for the next five weeks. Leading up to, I know, the holidays, right? Thanksgiving and Christmas. You remember that Christmas? We're going to do that again. It's going to happen, right? So I think, anyway. So uh, anyway, that's what we're going to be doing. So that's kind of our journey that we'll be taking. So uh, when you look at the book of 1 John, uh, there are, you recognize that three themes kind of emerge, okay? Uh, the three themes that emerge are that God is love, God is light, and God is life. Okay, those three themes you see all through the book of 1 John. And it's clear from the beginning, and we'll read the first uh, couple of verses in 1 John 1, it's clear from the beginning that John, remember, <laughs> now John is not saying, you know what, this is what I heard about Jesus. You know, some of the other writers of the New Testament, uh, like Paul and others, Paul met him, you know, after the, re the resurrection and after the ascension, but some of the other authors said, this is what we heard about Jesus. Uh, this is what we assume is true about Jesus because of what others have said. John didn't say that. John said, I know because I saw, I felt, I heard, I experienced, I touched, I know Jesus. And so when he's speaking, he's speaking with the authority of one who saw Jesus for the three years of it. Remember, John was just a fisherman for three years of his ministry. He saw him die on the cross. He saw him resurrected. He saw him multiple times after the resurrections, after the resurrection, and 40 days after, he saw him ascended to heaven. So John knows what he's talking about. And John would say something like this. Listen, if you find someone like Jesus who predicts his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and then he pulls it off, you better pay attention to him. He's got something to say, and he's got, he's got reason for you to believe him and to listen to him. So that is, by the way, this is much better than preaching to a camera. I mean, there are real people out here. This is awesome. I, I'm just really, this is, this is great. Yeah, that's right. Uh, because otherwise, I was just kind of looking at the camera. And once in a while, I looked at Sherry, but that was, that was pretty much it. So John says, listen, I know what happened. So what John is saying when it comes to this life, light, and love themes is that these are not simply distant and nebulous philosophical concepts. But this life, light, love of God, they are real. And they are available now. They're knowable. They're touchable. They're accessible. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is available through me. So let's begin, let's, if you have your Bibles or your uh, iPhones or whatever instruments you have, turn to 1 John chapter 1, and we're just going to look at the first three verses. Remember, today's just kind of an overview and introduction. The first three verses really set the tone uh, for this incredible journey that we'll be on. I'll be reading from the uh, NLT, the New Living Translation, and uh, it's very similar to the NIV if you have that as well. We'll put it up on the screen as well. Here's the word of God for the people of God at Grace Community Church. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. Does that sound familiar to the Gospel of John, verse 1, chapter 1, right? Right? Chapter 1, verse 1. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. In other words, John said, listen, this isn't just rumor. This just isn't story. This isn't oral tradition being passed from generation to generation. We saw it. We felt it. We were there. Whom we have seen and heard, we saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? He is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. Verse 3, we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship. Koinonia is the word, the Greek word there. You may have fellowship 
with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John is saying, listen, I was there. I saw him, I felt him, I heard him, I touched him. I knew his heart. I, I, I was the one that was always hanging around him. Uh, Peter was always getting in trouble. I was always there to kind of calm things down. He was probably a middle child. And uh, so all these things are going, and it's really, he said, I, I, I know it. This, this thing that I'm talking about, this uh, living into life, it's accessible. It's touchable. You can have it. And he uses that word fellowship, which is koinonia. It's used 19 times in the New Testament. 12 times it's translated fellowship. Three times it's translated sharing. And four times it's translated participating. Koinonia, life together. Back in the 70s, if you're old enough to remember, there was all kinds of things written about body life, life together, koinonia. It was all about being together in the body of Christ. And here... John says, listen, not only do we have that fellowship with the Father in heaven, that community, that connection, we have that same fellowship, that koinonia with each other. It's real. You can touch it. You can feel it. You can experience it. It is absolutely real. So this word, koinonia, fellowship, means to participate, to partner with God and with each other. So today, I want to talk to you for a few moments about an invitation to life. An invitation to life. John calls Jesus two things in this text. He calls him the word of life, and he calls him eternal life. In other words, Jesus, your name is the word of life, and Jesus, your name is eternal life. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, we read these words. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. In other words, eternal life is not a thing or an object or even a hope. Eternal life is in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what he means when he talks about that you are invited into this extraordinary life. Now, if you have the Son, John says, 1 John 5, 11, you have life. So on a very basic level, an invitation to, into life is an invitation into Jesus. Now, we all know, we all, many of us grew up in Sunday school, we know the rubrics, we know how it goes, that, um, you know, and, we were t- and nothing wrong with this, okay, we're t- you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, You need to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. All good, all true, nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we kind of get the wrong feeling about that. Say, okay, um, I I did it. I I, I said the prayer. I I raised my hand. Uh, I I walked down the aisle. And all again, all things are good. But it's like it was a object. It was a one-time thing. It was something that happened, that transpired, that that, uh, connected us to God. But that was kind of the end of it. And that's why we believe here at Grace Community Church in discipleship, in growing in your faith. Because it's not just about that initial saying yes to God. We need to do that. But it's not just about that. So we learn these things as a child. And we kind of learn that, okay, now I've got the package. I've got the commodity. Um, uh, Dallas Willard says it's like a barcode. Okay, we, 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 we say the prayer, we raise the hand, we do whatever, and, and, and we've got the barcode. It's like printed on us, okay? Now I'm, okay, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I can set God off to the side. Someday when I stand before God at the judgment, you know, he'll have the scanner. Oh, he's got the barcode, let him in. This one doesn't, you're out, you know, the sheep and goat thing. And, you know, and so, so it's that, okay, we've, we're set, okay? We've got our ticket punched to heaven. We're, got, we've, we're, we're, we're going to have eternal life. So many people, when they receive Christ, the thing that matters to them the most is, whew, I'm going to heaven. I've got eternal life. That's why uh, Catholics and other religions uh, baptize infants to make sure that that child, because of original sin, doesn't go to hell, right? We've got to get them baptized. We've got to, we've got to punch the ticket. We've got to put the barcode on them. We put the stamp on them. So, so John is saying, okay, all that's well and good, but that's not the answer. I mean, that's at a very basic level. Believing the right thing matters. I, I know that. Doing the right thing matters, but here's the deal. When you step into the life in Jesus, 
It's not just a list of behaviors. It's more than a moral code. It's more than doctrinal precepts. He brings life, a life force into our lives, a synergy, a synergism. John 15, um, Jesus, the vine, we are the branches. The life of Jesus, that juice, that sap that flows through Jesus, flows into you. There's that synergy. You have life in him. He has life in you. It's not about just punching a ticket. It's not about, oh, whew, I'm going to heaven now. It's about a life that matters. An eternal life, listen to this, eternal life begins the moment you say yes to Jesus. Eternal, sometimes we think that eternal life is that thing that's going to happen when we die. And we, we have wonderful funerals, memorial services, and we say to be absent in the body is to be present in the Lord, and that's all good. But eternal life, as John describes it, begins right now. You don't have to wait for anything. Yeah, I, 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 and sometimes I can't wait to go to heaven. I would love to see my son Tyler again. We just celebrated on October 12th. He would have been 41 years old. Um, he died shortly after his 10th birthday. We've missed him for 31. It'd be wonderful to see him. I, mean, I, I would love to see my mom and dad again. I'd love to see other family and friends again. But eternal life is not something I just, oh, I can't wait. It starts right now, John says. Right now. You don't have to wait for anything. So these things matter. But when we have this life in Jesus, when this life is flowing through us and into us, it really makes a difference. So this verse 1 says that you can know it, you can see it, you can hear it, you can touch it. And this morning, I am inviting each and every one of you here in this church and watching wherever you're watching from, that eternal life is available to you right now. Now, two things you're invited into. The first thing is this. It's not just a future hope, but a present reality. Not just a future hope, but a present reality. I mean, we think of eternal life as a duration. In other words, how long will it be? Well, a long time, right? It's eternity. Uh, but we think of it in terms of, well, that's something that's going to take place um, when I die, okay? At my funeral, uh, when I, you know, check out of this world, I'll check into the next one. And that's all, that's all good. But we think of it something like that. It kicks in when we die. And then we think to ourselves, well, do I have it? Do I have the barcode? Have I punched my ticket? Will I go to heaven when I die? Now, I'm saying all these things because all of you at different times have asked these questions. All of us have as Christ followers. Will I go to heaven when I die? Do I have the ticket? Will I make the cut? Do I know what I need to know? Have I prayed what I need to pray? Uh, when eternity kicks in, am I covered? I suggest to you that John has a different meaning of eternal life. It's not about duration of life that begins when I die, but primarily a quality of life that you can experience now. Eternal life is not just in future hope, but it is our present reality. It's knowable. Eternal life is knowable, touchable, accessible. Now, whenever someone comes to me and they uh, doubt their salvation, over the years I've had many, many people Christians all their lives say, you know, I'm not really sure, you know, I, I, I can't point to a time or a moment when I was 12 years old or I was 20 or I was three. I can't point to it, you know, I, and, and I, you know where I take them? I take them to 1 John 5. If you have the son, you have life. Is Jesus in your life? Is he living his life in you? Are you living his life? Yes, I am. Then you have life, okay? It's really simple when you look at 1 John. It's knowable, it's touchable, it's accessible now. John 10.10, 10, okay, Gospel, Gospel of John 10.10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. NIV, abundantly. You have life abundantly. So this invitation into life is an invitation to the present reality that eternal life begins now. The second thing I want to share this morning is this. The fullness of eternal life is experienced in partnership with the Father. Let me say it again. The fullness of eternal life is experienced in partnership with the Father. Now, the way we experience this life in partnership with the Father is found in verse 3 of our text. Let me read that again. We proclaim to you 
what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship, koinonia, with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John says we can have fellowship, well, he's talking to other Christ followers in the first century. We can have fellowship with one another and we can have fellowship with the Father. That fellowship again, koinonia, is a partnership. It's participation. Now, in a few weeks, I'm going to be inviting you. Right now, we're scheduling to have two Christmas Eve services. We might have to shift that and make more uh, if more people are comfortable coming back. But a Christmas Eve here at Grace and every church I've served, for me, has always been a, a, a time to reach the community for Christ. People that have not yet said yes to Jesus. People that are what I call pre-Christian. Uh, they've not yet stepped over that threshold of faith. And so we provide an opportunity to share the gospel that night and give them an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, right? And so when I talk about participating with the Holy Spirit, participating with the Heavenly Father, I'm basically saying this. You can do that on Christmas Eve. You can identify friends that you have, loved ones, people that you care about. Hey, come to church with me. It's safe. We've got those squirt bottles everywhere. We keep you parted. You know, we wear our masks. You know, we do all the stuff. And come to church with me. Come and sit with me. And when you're doing something like that, you are partnering with the Holy Spirit to reach one more for Jesus. The fullness of this life, the fullness of light, the fullness of love is felt, seen, and heard, and touched in participation with our Heavenly Father. So how do I access this partnership, this power? How do I go on this journey of life and light and love? I, I think the key to experiencing this is just one simple phrase. Surrender to his life. In other words, to give access of our hearts to him. Let me say it this way. Uh, God, I need more than a ticket to heaven. I don't want to sound ungrateful. And I appreciate everything you've done for me and everything you've done to prepare a house for me in heaven. I, I truly appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that someday I'll see my son Tyler again, my mother and father and others. Lord, I do not want to be ungrateful. But Father, I need help right now with this living thing. Because I don't do so good sometimes and sometimes I don't have much faith. And sometimes my family is falling apart. And sometimes I lose my job and sometimes I get COVID and sometimes everything goes wrong in my life. So, so Lord, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful that I get to go to heaven, that eternal life is something out there for me, but I need eternal life right now. I need it and I need it desperately. I mean, my marriage, Lord, is a mess. I, I'm glad I'm going to heaven. I'm glad I'm secure in my faith. I'm glad I've got my ticket punched in a barcode. I'm glad for all that. But Lord... You need to teach me how to love my wife right now because I'm not doing so good. And Lord, you know about my anger. And again, I'm, please, I, I'm, I'm thankful, Lord, so thankful that I have the barcode and that I'm going to heaven. And, but Lord, I, I, I need your life in me right now. I need to know how to deal with this anger right now. I need you right now. And Lord, this thing that I struggle with, this lust thing, again, I'm so glad that I'm secure in my salvation and that I'm going to heaven and eternal life is mine. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so glad that I have the barcode. But I need help with lust right now. And joy? Lord, I don't know where my joy's gone. I mean, this COVID thing, the, the racial unrest, all of these things that we're experiencing, I don't see any joy anywhere. I'm so glad that I'm going to heaven and there'll be joy there. But I need joy now. And peace I don't see it. I know there'll be peace in heaven. The lion lays down with the lamb. Those of you that have pets and think your pets are going to be in heaven, there's your verse. The lion lays down with the lamb. Okay, I, that, that's great, and that's, that's peace and all. But I don't have peace right now. I need to experience that life in Jesus, that partnership with the Father right now. The fact is, the very simple thing is that uh, I need more than eternity. I need to give God access to my heart. I need to present my life to him. Keith Meyer, a pastor and author, wrote these words. The most significant thing that we can give to God is not our money, it's not our time, it's not our effort, it's not our talent. 
The most significant thing we can give to God is our attention. Do you think you give God your attention? And I, I'm glad, Lord, I, I want to give you my money, my time, my talent. I want you to keep it all. The Lord says, that's good, but let me tell you what I really want from you, Dwayne. I want your attention. I want your attention. I want you to see me, touch me, recognize me, acknowledge me. Now, one simple way we give God our attention, we experienced this morning as Jeanette and the worship team led us in worship. You know, we've been worshiping together on Saturday, just our small group, and it's been good. I mean, we've worshiped the Lord, but like Jeanette said, there is something about being with the people of the Lord. You know, remember in, when we studied in Jeremiah, they went to the temple, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It's so great to be together. Authentic worship means we give God our attention. Now, I confess, I was raised as a musician, so music has always been important to me. And, uh, and I early, you can ask Sherry, early in my ministry, I was very critical of music that was subpar or wasn't excellent or something like that. And I learned a long time ago that that's not my job. My job is to pay attention to God. My job is to pay it. And this morning when I was singing those words and I was hearing the worship team, man, my heart was just so full. And you know what? I was paying attention to God. That's what we do in our worship. We give God our attention. We hear God say to us, you matter. I love you. Sometimes he convicts us of sin. He speaks truth into our lives. But there's that transforming effect of authentic worship. We pay attention to God by worshiping. We pay attention to God by praying. Dallas Willard says, talking to God about what you're doing together. That's prayer. I love that. Talking to God about what you are doing together, your partnership with God, your struggles, your praises, your joys, your difficult circumstances, what you're frightened about, you invite him in and you pay attention. And when you talk to God that way, not just a laundry list of stuff you want. Come on, that's not prayer. Prayer is this communion with God. Lord, I need this, but I feel this. And Lord, I see you, I know you, I hear you, I believe in you. It's that communion. It's that transforming effect that we have in prayer. You pay attention to God through prayer. And you pay attention to God through Scripture. G.K. Chesterton, you've heard me say this before, said, when you think of God, Sherry, you can finish this sentence, think magnificently of God. <laughs> when you open the Scriptures. Now, uh, in John... The Gospel of John, he talks about logos, which is the word. It means that, that big idea, uh, God's first idea. God's first idea was Jesus and redemption of the world, okay? So that big word, logos, it means Jesus. But there's another word for word in the word, okay? <laughs> that other word for word in the word is kairos. And kairos is a specific word to David or to Sherry, a specific word for you in this moment from God's word. We need kairos in our lives. And the only way that we can hear God speak to us is if we open his word and allow him to give us a kairos. That's how we pay attention to God. Now, I'm not talking about just a future hope, but I'm talking about a present reality, a present reality fully entered into when we can partner with our Heavenly Father. Now that's 1 John. That is what we'll be studying for the next several weeks. So as we prepare for the, new, the, the next sermons, let me ask you a couple of questions as we close. First thing is this. Is this kind of life that I'm inviting you into this morning, this eternal life, not in the sweet by and by, this eternal life, right? is this life something you're experiencing right now? If not, you can experience it. The sad truth is many have never tasted this life. Now, I shared with you a few weeks ago that 94% of Americans believe in God or a higher power. 74% claim to have made some kind of a commitment to God. 34% confess to some kind of new birth or experience with Jesus. But only 20% of people polled in, the, in, in Americans say that their religion or their faith has anything whatsoever to do with their lives. That's what's happening in our world today. 
oh, I believe in Christ because I want the barcode. I want the ticket punched. I want to go to heaven, right? I believe in Jesus, but he has nothing. To, what I am talking about today is inviting you into eternal life that begins today. And it began when you said yes to Jesus. And it will last for you for all eternity, starting right now. This life that God has given you. Dallas Willard again said, if the gospel we preach only provides a ticket to heaven and does not have power to have an effect on real life, I'm not sure I want it. Isn't that so true? How many people out there say they're believers and it has absolutely zero impact on their lives? So Father, help us communicate this truth to you today. Uh, Jesus would say to us, I want to do so much more than punch your ticket. I want to give you life and I want to give you power. One last verse, 1 John 3, 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Now, the first part of that sin, uh, sins kind of shudders through our, our minds and our hearts when we read it. What? No one who is born of God will continue to sin? And I sin every day. <laughs> I'm in serious trouble. Well, we could preach a whole series on that. I'll just say this. What that word means is to continuously, habitually, intentionally think of ways to get better at sinning. Now, some of you may be doing that. If, if you are, you're probably not a child of God. But that, so that's what I mean. It's not just that you sin, you know, because we all do. But continually, habitually, intentionally think of ways to get better. So I don't, I don't want to talk about that part. I want to talk about the second part of this. The second part. Because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. God's seed remains in you. Now, I don't want to be indelicate, but that word, the Greek word is spermata. And it means that you are filled, <laughs> listen, with the genetic makeup of God. You are programmed with the genetic makeup of God. God is alive in you. Eternity starts now. It's not in the sweet by and by. It's not when you punch your ticket and you go on to heaven. It begins right now because that is in you. My father uh, died at age 56 in 1983. Um, I mean, it's hard to believe that I'm, I mean, I'm 16 years older now than what he was when he died. But people have always said to me, man, my dad was name was Tommy, Tom. Man, Dwayne, you, you look like your father. Uh, you act like your father. My dad was 6'3", a mountain of a man. I mean, your mannerisms. When I, when I hear your voice, I hear Tom, right? Now, I'm not aware of this. I haven't tried to live my life like Tom or look like Tom. I have my own life, but there is a life force within me that precludes what I want to do. There is genetics in me that make me seem and act and look and talk like Tom Cross. Now, some could try and act, some of you could even try and act like Tom, but I have a distinct advantage because I was, I was born of him. I have his genetics, and I lived with him. I partnered with him. He had my attention, and I had his attention. God's seed remains in you. The life that God is inviting us into is not just a future hope, but a present reality. As we come to this present reality, we partner with God to experience life right now. Do you want this kind of life? Boy, I do. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, uh, Lord, this life that John refers to, for some of us, is um, unknowable, unreachable. We just don't really know how to grasp it. But Father, John gives us this word that we can have this eternal life in the person of Jesus. And as we partner with him and as we pay attention 
to him in our lives. Oh, Lord, the, 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 the joy, regardless of circumstances, the peace, regardless of anything going on in our lives, Lord, is available to us. And so, Father, my prayer for this congregation, for those who are here and those who are listening, that as we go through this incredible journey of 1 John, that we will experience this kind of life and this kind of light and this kind of love. Lord, I just thank you that uh, your word is true, your word is real, and I pray that you would just fill us with hope, fill us with your presence, fill us with your joy, fill us with your exquisite love that we might know you and the power of your resurrection. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.